We've had our introductory message, and this helps to fix our purpose in mind as we come to deal with these various issues. But we are still not ready to tackle these issues directly. We still have to establish our foundations. We have to be clear in our minds about Scripture and why we believe that its teaching is relevant to all these issues, to the controversies of the present day. And when it comes to Scripture, there are two major doctrines that we want to cover. The doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture and the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture. And in our Bible Presbyterian circles, we know these doctrines under the names of VPI, Verbal Plenary Inspiration, and VPP, Verbal Plenary Preservation. Of course, there is much more to say about Scripture, and even on these two doctrines, we will not have time to do more than just a brief overview. So I would encourage you, as we mentioned previously, to do your own reading. Ask your pastor for good books on these two doctrines, on Scripture. But most of all, search the Scriptures yourself, prayerfully. See whether these things are really so. That said, we come first of all to consider the doctrine of inspiration. And we will consider it here under just two topics. Firstly, the need for a written revelation from God. And secondly, the nature of this written revelation. First of all, the need for a written revelation. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. You know this verse, I'm sure. For context, let me read to you from verse 15 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Amen. Here we have richly and succinctly the doctrine of inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. But why did God give a written scripture? That is our focus here. Now, there's a good description of the need for a written revelation in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the very first paragraph of the first chapter. And let me read this for you. This is the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, paragraph 1 of the Holy Scripture. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable. Yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal Himself and to declare that His will unto His church and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, those former means or those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people being now ceased. And as we consider this paragraph in the Westminster Confession, we can see three aspects of this need for a written revelation. Firstly, we see the deficiency of natural revelation. Secondly, we see the efficiency of a written revelation. And thirdly, we see what we may call the vacancy or the cessation of former means of revelation. And we'll look at each of these in turn. First of all, we consider the deficiency of natural revelation. And of course, this is not a deficiency in the sense that God made a mistake. 
Indeed, as it is affirmed in the confession of faith and in Scripture, God, the natural world, the works of God in the natural world, the works of creation and providence, in all these God reveals Himself very clearly. And these things that we see around us reflect the glory and certain of the attributes of God. This is clearly taught, for instance, in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, let me read to you the first few verses. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Here the psalmist David declares that the heavens, the earth, the natural world declares the glory of God. Declares it in such a way as to be unmistakable. There is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Every human being is exposed to this revelation in all of its clarity. Every human being as he observes the world around him, gains an insight into the nature of God. He sees God's power displayed. He sees God's wisdom. He sees God's goodness. So much so that men who deny God and refuse to give Him glory and refuse to thank Him are without excuse. This the Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Let me read this for you. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, in all mankind. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They knew God. This is not a knowledge that they gained through their own human ingenuity, but God revealed Himself to mankind, plainly and clearly. God hath showed it unto them, the Apostle says. But instead of recognizing that, instead of accepting that revelation, instead of embracing that knowledge, instead of worshipping God, they rejected Him. Instead of thanking God, they were not thankful to Him for their own existence, for his works of providence, sustaining them. And so the rejection of sinful men of this testimony is inexcusable. The invisible things of God whom we cannot see are displayed clearly in his creation. But instead, mankind sought to replace God, the creator, with their own vain imaginations, with speculations and theories. And so they are condemned. So the natural revelation reveals God to us very clearly. But there is something that the natural revelation cannot do and does not reveal. In the works of creation and providence, God is indeed revealed to us in all His glory and power and wisdom and goodness. But the way to God is not revealed. On the contrary, the natural revelation includes the individual testimony of conscience. This also the Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 1 and 2. Romans chapter 1 verse 32, for example, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. In chapter 2 verse 15 of Romans, the Gentiles, Paul says, show the work of the law written in their hearts, 
their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. We all have a conscience. We all have a sense of right and wrong. And this conscience accuses those things that are wrong and excuses, commends, defends those things that are right. And this conscience operates in all of us naturally. As we go through life, we see things that are wrong and our conscience accuses those things. We see things that are right and our conscience excuses or defends those things. We see both right and wrong. We have a sense of right and we have a sense of wrong. And we employ this moral consciousness, this moral reasoning, these thoughts, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans chapter 2, verse 15. Their thoughts, their moral reasoning coming from the conscience. We employ this very liberally when we are judging the works of others, primarily in a negative sense. We're very quick to sit in judgment of others, to criticize others and say, that was wrong. He or she should not have done that. But if we are honest, and if we turn this conscience inward and examine ourselves honestly, we know that we ourselves have not kept to this standard. Even this imperfect standard of our conscience, our moral consciousness, impaired and corrupted by the fall and by sin, even this imperfect standard is too high for us. We know that we have not kept it. We know that we have done things that we know are wrong. We know that lying is wrong. That's conscience. And yet we all know that we have done that. We know that saying hurtful words to someone else is wrong. And yet we all know that we have said such words, even to people that we claim to love very much. Our conscience, this natural revelation of God, as we compare ourselves against the standard that God has impressed on our hearts, we know that we have fallen short. If there is a perfect standard of righteousness, we are far, far from it. If there is a just and holy and glorious and pure and perfect God, then we cannot stand before him. So the natural revelation reveals that there is such a God, perfect and glorious and holy, but it also reveals that we are condemned before him. We are guilty. The natural revelation gives us no hope when it comes to a relationship with God. Hence the need for a spiritual, written, special, revelation because God planned and willed that man should not remain in his miserable state but be rescued and redeemed and reconciled and brought back into relationship and communion with God and God purposed to reveal that way of salvation through his word through a special written revelation and that brings us to the next aspect of the need for a written revelation, which is the efficiency of written revelation. The natural revelation reveals some things about God, it reveals them very clearly, but it does not reveal the way to God. It is deficient, we may say, in that respect. It cannot save. It cannot bring us to God. It can only condemn. And so the written, special revelation is given to show us the way of salvation. But now we come to consider the efficiency of a written revelation. God revealed his salvific will for mankind. As we read in the Westminster Confession, quoting from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, at sundry times and in diverse manners. He spoke directly to Adam and Eve in the garden to give them hope of salvation after their fall, Genesis 3.15, promising the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent. And that, as we know, is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He spoke to Noah, promising by a gracious covenant 
never again to destroy the world by, by the waters of a flood until his plan of salvation should be completed and consummated, and then the world will be destroyed, not by water, but by fire. But he revealed to Noah by this gracious covenant that the world would continue, the world would persist, salvation would be possible. And then he appeared to Abraham again with that message of salvation, the promise to Abraham, the promise of a saviour in thee, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. But since the time of Moses, or even some time before that, if you take the book of Job as written before Moses, since that time, God has been pleased to give to man a written revelation, a written record of his revelation to man, a written record of his will for man's salvation. And you notice the qualities of this written record, of this written revelation as it is described in the Westminster Confession. This written revelation is more effective in terms of preserving and propagating the truth. Afterwards, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth. Words that are written down are more easily preserved than, say, oral traditions. And we know this just from our day-to-day -day experience, it's obvious to us. If you want to remember something, if you want to preserve that information, you write it down. The most efficient and effective way of preserving information is usually in writing. You can't trust it to your memory. If you want to propagate or spread a message, you put it in writing. If you don't want that message to be changed or altered as it goes through its process of transmission, you put it in writing, you use a written message, you use words. Memories can be unstable, but words do not change. They can be changed, they can be altered by malice or incompetence. But words have this intrinsic quality of permanence. A written record is more permanent, it is more easily preserved, it is more accurately propagated. And God intended for his saving will for mankind to be preserved and propagated. So he gave it in the form of a written revelation, which has greater efficiency in that regard. Then again, as the Westminster Confession puts it, a written revelation is more effective in terms of the establishment and comfort of the church. For the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church. And this also is something that we know from our day-to-day -day experience. Many countries and organizations have a written constitution, a foundational document laying out the principles by which and for which that organization has come to be. Of course, some countries don't have a written constitution. I believe the UK is one example of that, and we can debate the relative merits or demerits of such a thing. But nevertheless, it is true, by and large, even in the secular realm, that we recognize the efficiency of a written document to serve as an established foundation for something. If you want to establish something securely, you put it in writing. The last will and testament of someone is put in writing so that it can be established securely. Even after that person's passing, the words remain. That person's will remains. It can be accessed. It can be interpreted. It can be carried out because it was put in writing. And we recognize that. It is more effective to establish something by putting it in writing. And so the written record of Scripture serves as a foundation. We read that in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Again, let me read this for you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, built on the foundation of 
of the apostles and prophets, the written record of Scripture, the written testimony of the apostles and prophets to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone of the whole structure. So a written record that serves as a foundation, that written record can be checked, it can be constantly accessed, so that we as a church are preserved from error, from falsehood, from deception, from the malice of Satan and the world, as the Confession of Faith puts it. We are preserved from that because we have a, we have a written record that we can check. We can check any new teaching that we get against this written word. Remember the Bereans again, who we mentioned last time, they searched the scriptures. They had scriptures to search. They had a written record against which they could check even the Apostle Paul's preaching to them. They could see for themselves whether those things were so, because they had a written revelation. The written revelation is more effective for the establishment of the church. So even the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20, speaks of this written record. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You can check because you have a written law, a written testimony. That is a sure foundation. It is something established, and you can build on that. Then again, the Confession of Faith also speaks of the comfort that comes through this written revelation. Again, because it is something established, and I neglected to mention earlier a couple of points further about the establishment that comes from this written revelation. This is something that even the writers of Scripture themselves recognize. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, very interestingly in the prologue to his Gospel, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, he makes reference to this certainty that comes from a written record. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Luke has access to all these previous declarations and eyewitness testimonies. But then he goes on, verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, through his investigation, through his personal experience, through his interviews perhaps with those who had been personally eyewitnesses of all these things, having had perfect understanding of all these things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, to write, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed, that you might know the certainty of them I have written to you, now you will have a written account of the life of Christ. You will have a written record of all that he said and did, so that you will know the certainty of the things wherein you have been instructed. So even the writers themselves recognize the efficiency of a written revelation, of a written record in establishing something. You remember how the Lord Jesus met the malice of Satan, in his temptation in the wilderness. It is written, he said. He made reference to that written record. And if the Lord Jesus, as our perfect example, used the written revelation of Scripture to ward off the attacks of the devil, so also we, his church, ought to do the same. Because we have Scriptures that are written. We can say when temptation comes, it is written. We can say in the face of deception, no, that is not true. And I know it is not true because it is written otherwise. So for the more sure establishment of the church, God committed his word to writing. 
God committed his revelation to this written medium. So Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Now we come to the comfort, the comfort that is also more sure when we have a written record. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Again, let me read this. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Patience and comfort of the written scriptures. In that we have hope. Realize how marvelous it is that we have this written record how we deprive ourselves of the comfort that God intends for us to have when we neglect the reading, the studying, the searching of the Scriptures, when we don't bother to take the time to avail ourselves of this written revelation. Patience and comfort of the Scriptures, all these things were written for us, Paul says, written for our learning so that we might have hope that is sure, so that we might have patience and comfort in this written scripture. What a comfort, what an assurance it is to read these unchanging words of absolute truth. We have a God who does not change. His promises do not fail. His word cannot be broken. And it is here recorded for us. Nothing altered, nothing changed. God's word this written revelation, and through it we derive an unspeakable, unshakable comfort. Surely you have experienced this for yourself. It is one thing for man to say something. It's one thing for a person to speak words of comfort to you. But when the Almighty God speaks to you in His Word, in words that are so pure and perfect, in words that do not change, in words that are absolutely true, what an unspeakable comfort it is when God speaks to us through His Word, not through some dream or vision, marvelous as that would be, but He speaks through His written Word. And if anything, that is even more marvelous. I hope you have had that experience of patience and comfort in the scriptures. Now, of course, this does not mean that God could not have revealed His will to us in any other way. God could not have revealed His saving will to man in any other way. It is not at all that God is limited or restricted by the qualities of a written word. In fact, this writing and language came from God. He created them. Ultimately, He designed them for this purpose, and He has used them to record His will for us. And this is an important point. God inspired words. You realize that? Words, not pictures. He could have. He could have inspired a picture book. He could have inspired a film of the life of Christ. But He did not. And there's a reason for that. He specifically chose to inspire words. These words are important. They are the words that God has chosen to record and contain His will for us, His revelation that He wants us to have and to know and to live by. God inspired words. I'm not saying that we cannot use illustrations or pictures or even films. These things have their place. They can be very useful. By all means, use them. Be as effective as you can. But be wary of departing from the words of Scripture. Be wary of giving too much emphasis to those things. Because it is the words that are central. It is the words that God has inspired. This is an important point, and we will come back to it later. But for now, we move on to the third aspect of the need for a written revelation. And that is the vacancy or the cessation of former means of revelation. 
Again, hear how the Westminster Confession puts it. Which maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people being now ceased. The former methods have ceased. There is no more special revelation in visions, in dreams, no more predictive prophecies as there were in the Old Testament, for example. All of those former means have ceased, including the writing of Scripture. That has also ceased. The prophets and apostles, and that's the end. After that, there is no more Scripture being written. The foundation is laid. Now, this is a whole topic by itself, the cessation of these means of special revelation. And it's an important topic, especially in light of contemporary claims that are made by many of those in the charismatic movement. And we don't have time to go into these things in detail here. But the point here is that if those former methods have, had not ceased, then we would still be looking for God to speak to us by those means. We would be looking for God to speak to us in a vision or in a dream. We would be looking for God to inspire some fresh revelation, some fresh writing that we would then have to add to the 66 books that we have now. We would be looking for those things. But as we consider these claims of such fresh revelation, we find them to be very lacking. Moreover, and more importantly, we find teaching in Scripture that these former methods have ceased. Again, for instance, we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And that foundation is laid. There are no more apostles and prophets today. No one else is writing Scripture. A foundation is laid and then it's done. You don't keep laying the foundation. Now it is laid and now we build on it. We build on what has been written. We don't add any new writings. All of that has ceased. We have the completed canon. And now God speaks to us, not in visions, not in dreams, but He speaks to us in His Word. By the illumination and guidance of His Spirit, He speaks to us through His Word. He has committed His special revelation to mankind. He has recorded His saving will for mankind and committed it, in the words of the Confession of Faith, wholly unto writing. And now we have here in this book everything that God wants us to know about Him, about us, but His will for us. It is all recorded for us here in this book. Whatever our situation now at the present time, God has anticipated it. Indeed, He has ordained it. And He has prepared all that we need to know to meet that situation here in His Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. All that we need to be perfect, to be complete, to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, all of that is here. Those former methods have ceased. Now we have a perfect, completed, written revelation from God. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, these things happened to them in the Old Testament, to Israel, for ensamples. And now we have them as a written record, recorded for us, for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come, for our learning, for our admonition, for doctrine, reproof, for Correction for instruction in righteousness. God's word is here for us. We have this written revelation. There was a need for special revelation, for special written revelation, and now we have it complete. So we come now to the nature of this revelation. We see the need for written revelation. But again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now our focus is what exactly is scripture and how did God give it? And again, we'll consider it under two headings. Firstly, as we come to consider the nature of the written revelation, we want to consider the process of inspiration. And then secondly, we want to consider the product of inspiration. Process and the product. First of all, the process. In the simple definition of this process, we find in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. Again, let me read this. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The writers of Scripture were men, ordinary human beings, with all of the common weaknesses and frailties of humanity, of fallen humanity. And yet they were moved by the Holy Ghost, moved by the Spirit of God in such a way that those things which they wrote, those words which they wrote, were the very words of God, inspired of God, breathed out, to be more literal, by God. How exactly did this happen? Well, there is much that we do not know. We are not told all the details. There is a mystery here, how the Spirit works. As with many of the other workings of the Holy Spirit, there is a mystery. You remember how the Lord Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeth. You cannot tell where it came from, where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. There is a mystery to the workings of the Holy Spirit. But there are some things that we can say. Some things are revealed to us about the process of inspiration. We can say that the methods by which God revealed His Word to the writers of Scripture has been diverse. Sundry times and diverse manners, God spoke. Some of it is by direct revelation. The account of creation and fall, the early history of the world, that was directly revealed by God to Moses. We don't know exactly how, but Moses was not there. He was not an eyewitness. God revealed it to him and he wrote it. And it is perfect the very words of God. So also the prophetic books of the Old Testament. God revealed these things to his prophets, visions of the future, visions of the heavenly realm. God revealed things to them directly and they wrote it down. And those are the very words of God. In some cases, the biblical writers are told precisely what to write. For example, in Revelation, the letters, the seven letters to the churches. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, for instance. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. These are exactly the words that you are to write. This is the Lord Jesus telling the apostle John, write these very words and send them to the churches. This is the message of Christ to his church. So we have these instances of direct revelation. But other parts of Scripture are not by such direct revelation. The Gospels, for example, are eyewitness accounts. They were there. And in the case of Luke, in his prologue, as we have read, he listened to these eyewitness accounts. He had access to all these previous testimonies about the life of Christ. He gathered them and based on what he also knew through his association with the Apostle Paul, he compiled everything and wrote it out in order to Theophilus. That was his purpose. He had a human purpose. He had a human method of gathering all this information and putting it in order and writing it. And yet, those are the very words of God. He was moved and used by the Holy Spirit in such a way that what he wrote with his human method and human purpose is the perfect, infallible Word of God. So also we can say that the process of inspiration and all these diverse manners, 
does not involve a negation of the human writer's personality. Again, there's a mystery to this. How exactly this comes to be, we don't know. But we know that it is true. God reveals it to us. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, but they are not erased by the Holy Ghost. They are not turned into mindless instruments of the Holy Ghost. They are used and moved in such a way that their human personality is preserved and it comes through in their writing. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians so passionately, when he says, I would that they were even cut off which trouble you, he loves them. He sees them being seduced away from the faith. And he writes with all the passion in his heart. That's his actual passion. It's not fake, it's real. And yet the words that he writes out of that burning passion are the very words of God. His personality is not negated, but yet he writes God's words. So also when David writes in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me from the words of my roaring? That's his actual emotion. He is expressing the true emotion of his heart. That's his personality. That's his experience. And yet, those are the very words of God. Do you see, the Bible is a unique book. There is no book like this in all the world, divine, and yet somehow so human, perfect, and yet we see in it all the faults and fallibilities of fallen humanity. We see in it a mirror of our own fallen state, but we see also the perfection that God has designed and prepared and promised to those who will believe in the name of His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other book like it. The process of inspiration, marvelous, mysterious, unique. Now we want to consider also the product of this process. What then of the actual text that was inspired by this process? To what extent can we say that this is the Word of God? That all of these words are actually the Word of God? Now there are some who say that the Bible contains the Word of God, but is not identical with the Word of God. That is to say, the Bible in a way becomes the Word of God when you read it and it impacts you in some special way. This view allows for mistakes in the so-called inspired text. It turns inspiration effectively into something, something subjective. But that is not the teaching of Scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is a simple statement of fact. Inspiration depends on God. It is not a subjective experience of the human reader. God inspired his word. It is a fact, an objective fact of the divine activity. Then again, there are some who say that the Bible is inspired in terms of its religious and spiritual teaching the religious and spiritual truth it is intended to convey, that is inspired, that is infallible, that is without error. But they allow room for certain more mundane errors, historical inaccuracies, numerical discrepancies. These kinds of things they say are in Scripture, but that does not, to them, it's their claim, that does not negate the fact that scripture is inspired. And when it is teaching something spiritual, that teaching is true and accurate. But when it comes to other matters, more mundane matters, there may be errors here and there. But again, this is not the teaching of scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Moreover, very importantly, the message of the gospel is bound up in historical facts. The gospel message is not a spiritual theory. It is not something esoteric. It's not a collection of abstract principles. The gospel message is a record of something that God has done and not something that he has done in heaven. 
in some faraway realm, inaccessible to us, unknown to us. It's a record of something that God has done on the stage of human history. The incarnation of the Son of God in a physical human body, at a particular point in human history, the account of his life and ministry within a particular geographical region on the face of this same earth on which we now stand or sit. His substitutionary death, his burial, his resurrection after a specific numerically defined amount of time. You remember how the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, even where he is quoting so succinctly the gospel message, he does not neglect to mention that the Lord Jesus rose on the third day according to the scriptures. The third day, that's a number. If there are mistakes in the numbers of the Bible, if the numbers are somehow allowed to be wrong, then what of that number? What if that number was wrong? That's a historical fact. If it's wrong, the whole message is called into question. These are historical facts. You cannot separate the historical facts of the gospel message from its spiritual content. Either all of it is true, or all of it is subject to question and suspect. So the biblical teaching is that the Word of God is inspired in its entirety. Every word is inspired. Therefore, it is perfectly accurate in all that it states and in all that it teaches, even in matters of history and science and so on. Every word is true. Now, that does not mean that the Bible cannot be misinterpreted. Of course, it can. It has been. It will continue to be misinterpreted. But when it is rightly interpreted, it is absolutely true. That's the biblical teaching, the biblical position. That's the product of inspiration. This inspired text that is perfectly true. So that is what we mean when we say that the Bible is the Word of God. It is His special revelation, special written revelation, a revelation of His salvific will for mankind, inspired by Him and committed to writing for its preservation and propagation, for the establishment and comfort of His Church, intended by God to be a sufficient testimony to instruct and guide us in all our life, all our witness, all our service for Him. And there's been a lot to cover, and there is much more that could be said. But these things are important because this is a foundational matter. And I want to close with this emphasis because it has become tragically common for people to take the Bible for granted. It's so easy to get a Bible nowadays in many, if not most parts of the world. Many of us, I'm sure, have more than one Bible, many Bibles, Bibles sitting on your shelf, perhaps Bibles in every room of your house. But it is heartbreaking how few actually read, how few actually study, how few actually open the pages of this book with the real recognition that it is the inspired Word of God. It is tragic that even for Christians, reading the Bible is not high on our list of priorities. If we are honest with ourselves, there are many other things that we would rather do. We have in our hands, close at hand, within easy reach, the inspired Word of the living God. And there is something else that we would rather do. The entertainment of the world, the words, the fantasies, the imaginations of man are more attractive to us than the Word of God. This is reality, and yet we would rather lose ourselves in fantasy, video games and movies. It is tragic. Christians, young people especially, spending all their time giving all their affection to those things. Those are not the words of God. Those are not inspired of Him. This book is. 
Will you not spend time on it? And so often the experience of the psalmists is something alien to us when we read it. Think of Psalm 1. The description of that blessed man. Psalm 1 verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We've read that verse many times, I'm sure. We may even have memorized, memorized it. But is that your experience? Do you delight in the law of God? Do you delight in it? Do you meditate in it day and night? If you really knew, if you really believed that these are the inspired words of God, wouldn't that change your attitude toward the Bible? Wouldn't that change your affection for it, your desire to spend time reading and studying and meditating on it? And even stronger is Psalm 119, verse 20. Have you read this psalm? Psalm 119 verse 20 My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. My soul breaketh. He longs for God's judgments. He longs for God's he longs for God's direction and guidance. As he looks at this world as he faces affliction and suffering, he wants to know what is right and what is wrong. He wants to know what he should do and what he should not do. He wants that comfort and assurance that can come from the voice of the living God speaking to him in his distress. He longs for God's judgment, for God's guidance. Life is complex and confusing and he longs to know what God wants him to do. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. If you have not had this experience, if these words seem strange and foreign to you, then it may be, perhaps, that you have not properly appreciated the doctrine of inspiration. You may have heard it many times. You may know it well. But have you appreciated what it really means to say that this book is God's word? The fact is that life in this fallen world is complex and confusing. But this is a foundational issue. If we neglect this objective record of truth which God has inspired for us, then we cannot begin to give a clear answer to all these questions that we face. God has made provision for us. He has given us the truth. If we neglect it, if we despise it, if we lightly esteem it, we will not have the answers that God intends for us to have. So I urge you, recognize, appreciate, understand what it means. This book you have in your hands, there on your desk or on your shelf, is the Word of God. It is the Word of life. It is inspired by God, breathed out by Him. It is His message for you. It was written by Him with you in mind. Whatever you're going through, God knows it. And He has recorded in His Word all that you need to face that situation and to glorify Him in it. He wants you to know those things. If you will only open the pages and read, pray and read, and God speaks it's the marvelous privilege that we have as Christians. So that is the doctrine of inspiration. And there's one further thing that we still need to deal with, because increasingly nowadays we find even Christians saying that this objective record of truth was perfect in the past, but is not so perfect today. So we have to deal with that issue, the issue of the preservation of Scripture. Can God's Word speak with the same perfect authority today as it has in the past? We'll deal with that in the next message. But for now, again, I urge you, recognize that this is God's Word. Delight yourself in it. Experience His voice speaking to you through His Word. 
It is life-changing and transforming. It is comforting and assuring. Don't miss out on that, that blessing that God has for you, because you can't be bothered to open this book and read it. Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, you have inspired and preserved this word for us, for our learning, because you know how ignorant and foolish we are, for our patience and comfort, because you know how frail and feeble is our faith, for our instruction in righteousness, for you know how confused we are when we face temptation and deception in this life. We ask for thy forgiveness for the times when we have lightly esteemed and neglected your word. Help us never again to do that. Work in us by your Spirit that we may have the highest regard for your word, that we may love it and read it and find much pleasure and joy and delight in studying it and learning it. We pray that you would wean us from the love of the world, and all the things in this world, the attractions, the entertainments, that can be so distracting. Help us to focus on you and to spend time in your word. And we know, we trust, according to your promise, that you will speak to us in your word. You will guide us, direct us, and give us joy and peace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.